Uh, if you don't know this, I'm sure you've heard several stories about F3, our workout group that we're a part of. That's where I first met Sean four years ago in uh, August of 2018. I remember showing up at my first workout uh, confused, one, why on earth would any man in his right mind show up before the sun in a random park in New Orleans to exercise? As I showed up there where we uh, plant our shovel flag and was waiting for those to arrive, waiting for the, the 530 mark to go where we could start, in through the darkness comes a man with long hair, barefooted from Arkansas. And at that moment, I knew as I met Craig Parton for the first time that I was in a different kind of group. As we continued in our workout, we get down to an area where we were working out. I was vastly overweight at the time. I always looked like I was playing a game of chubby bunny with myself, if you know what that is. Uh, I just had my, my oldest son. He was four months at the time. I had gained all the sympathy weight that my wife had gained as well. And uh, as we were working out, I see a man running through the darkness with a shiny head and I'm looking and saying, I want to be like that man. And then I heard him yell his F3 name, Red Sox. I'm like, oh, we have so much in common. He's a pastor like me. He's also a Red Sox fan like me. Little did I learn that he was a pastor and indeed not a Red Sox fan. Uh, but from that moment, I, I had that thought as I went home that day. I was like, I want to be like him. I want to be like him. And it's been a joke over the while. I remember uh, a couple years in F3, the moment that I blazed by Sean in a workout and was like, I've made it. I've arrived. I've done everything. that. I but I will tell you this about your pastor. He is a man of discipline. And I've always admired how much he uh, loves his wife, how much he loves his kids. I've always admired how ferocious he reads, how much of a learner he is. I, I aspire to be that. And he takes very serious this moment every Sunday morning where he gets to preach and teach the Word of God. He's become one of my favorite pastors, one of my favorite YouTubers. And Sean, I will uh, I tell you, I think it's a great honor to be here this morning. So thank you for trusting me with your church and with your pulpit this morning. So how do we pray like Paul? How do we pray? I, I moved here 10 years ago from South Alabama to go to the Baptist Seminary. And I learned very quickly that New Orleans is not like home. It's different. We are a melting pot of cultures and of people, of, of ideologies. And, and at times, you, you don't know what to do with it, but in, at times, it's a, it's a really beautiful thing as well. I, I remember the first time being here, my, my wife teaches in a public school in Jefferson Parish, and uh, we laughed. She's from, she's from Indiana. I'm from South Alabama. And it, it was the first time that we saw a school that was a melting pot of, of backgrounds and cultures. In my wife's classes, she has Muslim students and Jewish students. She has agnostics and atheists and Christians. We have all these individuals in our city. This week, for the first time, I had a conversation with, with a Mormon. I, I, we meet all of these people. And then with all these people, we find a, a backdrop in which everyone has this concept of what they think prayer is, but really don't know what to do with it. For some people, prayer is almost like a mystic exercise. It's one of those things that we, we do and we don't know why. It's kind of like a, a way for us to get to, to know this unknown God. For some individuals in our, our, our society, it's, a, it's like a breathing exercise. It's a, a way to be centered. I, I don't really know what that means, but I've heard this terminology when it comes to prayer. I've heard people use prayer as this idea that they, it's something that they do to this unknown deity out there somewhere. They don't know who he is or what he does. They really don't have a relationship with him, but they know that when the time comes, if they just bow their heads and they say words, that somebody out there somewhere is listening. Now, we all know that that's not true. You know, prayer that is much deeper and bigger than all those things, but, but even as followers of Christ, we struggle with prayer. I'm in a discipleship group with a few men at my church, and over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about prayer, and we get at the end of every week, and we're just so discouraged because it's something that we so want to do. We so want to be involved in intentional prayer, but yet at the same time, we're like, how do I do it, and where do I start, and why is something that seems so easy, so hard for us to create a discipline to do in our own lives? If you allow me a moment of levity, I think what happens in each of our lives is that we almost belittle prayer unintentionally into a few prayers that, that I've given names for. So if you'll just bear with me for a second, there are several different kind of prayers that even us as followers of Christ, well-intentioned as we may be, we participate in. The first prayer is the one I call the Santa Claus prayer. The Santa Claus prayer is this. We go to God with a list of requests with the hopes that if we're good enough, he'll answer them. 
you get the image of a child running up to the mall, sitting on Santa's lap, giving Santa, Santa, what do you want? You know, Santa asks the kids, what do you want? And he says, I want this, I want this, I want this. Gone. We do it in our own lives. Lord, we want to be healthy and wealthy and wise. Lord, give me the wealth of Elon Musk. Give me the wisdom of Sean Wilson. Give me the fitness ability of Craig Parton. You know what I mean? Like, we go to God with this list of things we want to do, and then we bolt. And we never want to stop to listen to God. We never want to stop to see what, if God, what would God have for our lives. We just go to him with our list, and Lord, I've been good enough. Bless me. The second kind of prayer that I've been tempted to pray in my own life is what I call the, the be with prayers. The be with prayers looks like this. All well intention, we go to God. We have a list of prayer requests. We know of individuals in our lives. They've gone through hard times. They've gone through diseases. They've gone through sickness. They've gone through wealth and, or, or through, through other issues. And then we go to God like this. Lord, be with this person and be with this person and be with this person. And that's all good. It's well intentioned. But the, the issue that's in the backdrop is that God's never left them. He's always been with them. Prayer is so much deeper than that. The third kind of prayer is what I call the, the oh no prayers. The oh no prayers happen right about the time you rear in somebody in traffic or right before the big test at school. Oh no, Lord, bail me out of this situation. The, the fourth kind of prayer is what I call the good vibes prayer. The good vibes prayer is this. The good vibe prayer is that, that happens on, on, the, on the nightly news when some issue or situation takes place in our city. Cameraman's out there. They're talking to a neighbor. And they turn to the neighbor and says, you know, what do you want to have to say from the neighbor? And the neighbor says, you know, our prayers just go out to the family. Our prayers just go out to the situation. And I'm sitting there saying, prayers for what and to who and to why? It's just a, a filler moment to make us feel good and try to find some way to put a Band-Aid on what's already a terrible situation. The, the fifth kind of prayer that, that I have is what I call the grocery store prayer. The grocery store prayer is this. It's when you meet somebody you haven't seen in a while in the grocery store. They tell you about a, a, a serious issue that's taking place in their life, health, sickness, job loss, whatever. And you look at them and you say, I'll be praying for you. And that praying for you is about three seconds from the time of the end that conversation ends until you walk out because it is gone after that. And the last kind of prayer that I see that we do a lot of times is what I call mandatory prayers. The mandatory prayers are those prayers that we pray right before our meals, right before a sporting event or other athletic activity that we are. It's just a prayer that we just do. All these prayers are well-intentioned. None of us go into this moment of prayer and say, I just want to belittle God. I just don't want to make it serious. But unfortunately, any of those prayers that I just mentioned, they rob God of his power and they demonstrate a weak faith on our behalf. Prayer is so much bigger than that. Prayer is an opportunity for us as followers of Christ to express our thoughts and our needs and our desires. Prayer is an opportunity for us as individuals to commune with a holy God. And we do that. And whether we pray, for whom we pray, and what we pray, all express something about our own faith. So how do we pray? What do we do? I look at the Apostle Paul because I find him as somebody of a man of faith in Scripture. And if there's anyone that I would say, I'd like, I want to be like him when I grow up, it's, it's probably Paul. So how did Paul pray? In Ephesians chapter 1 and chapter 3 specifically, towards the end of both of those chapters, you see prayers that Paul prays for the church of Ephesus. It's a church that he loved desperately. And I'm going to give you a quick disclaimer and almost sum up Paul's prayer life by these three statements. Paul does not generally pray for tangible needs. He just doesn't. It's not something that he didn't want to do, but he just generally speaking, he doesn't pray for tangible needs. He doesn't necessarily give us a how-to approach for prayer. And finally, Paul's prayers generally gravitate toward the eternal and not the temporal. So as we look at Ephesians, how do we pray like the Apostle Paul? The first thing I want us to look at is the person of prayer, the person of prayer. If you look in Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 2, and then we'll jump down to verse uh, 16 and 17, it says this, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, while making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. You know, uh, titles mean things. Titles have very significant uh, contributions to our lives. Uh, one of the, the things that I've had a unique uh, opportunity here in the city to do is uh, my pastor uh, at Metairie Baptist. He is uh, both my senior pastor at the church. He is, uh, historically has been the dean of Lovell College, the, an undergraduate program at the Baptist Seminary. 
And I've had opportunities to be his associate pastor for almost seven years now. I've also had an opportunity to teach classes at Level College. And uh, we have a very unique relationship. And uh, during the week, he, he offices at the seminary. I, I work another job at the seminary as well. And so I'm always in and out running by his office. And, and I always have to preface the conversation. One day I walked into his office and there was a, a burning issue at church. And I walked in the door, tapped the door, walked in. And I said, uh, hey, hey, pastor. And we, uh, we sat down. We solved world problems. We fixed the whole church in a 10-minute meeting. Not really. Um, and uh, so the conversation ends about the church. And I said, uh, so now that we're done with that conversation, I said, so, um, so Dr. Strong. And he perked up in his chair and he fixed his shirt. And he said, yes. The conversation had changed. The title had changed. Because titles mean things. You know, Paul could have used a whole host of titles to describe our Heavenly Father in this moment. He could have used a title such as Sovereign God. He could have called him the Righteous Judge. He could have used the Omnipotent One. But Paul chose a very specific title in these verses. He called him Father. The word used there in the Bible for Father is a word called Abba, and it it has the same connotation of of that of, of Daddy. And when we use a word like Father, there's a certain level of intimacy that comes with that. Um, in the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer, he tells them at the very beginning to address him as our Father. And in 1 John 3, we get this image of a Father, and it's a term that even John uses. It says, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. Father, Daddy, there's intimacy in addressing God that way. Uh, I told you uh, I... um, I'm from South Alabama, and in South Alabama, there are several titles that I've taken on in my life. My little sisters call me Bubba. It's probably the last ounce of Southern Alabama left in me. My sisters, to this day, they are grown, they are out of college, and they still call me Bubba. Uh, my, my wife, she calls me Babe. My, uh, my students at the seminary, they call me Mr. Weaver, as well as the lady who calls my name out at the doctor's office. She calls me Mr. Weaver. Uh, everyone else calls me Patrick. But my oldest son, my son, he's four years old, he calls me daddy. And he's the only person in the world that when I hear the name daddy, it means something. It's different. I think about the love of a father. Many of you can relate to that idea, whether you've been a father, whether you've had a father, you, you know someone that you respect as a father. And there's, there's some things that come with the idea of father. It, it's one that we can go to with our problems. It, it's one that has a sense of encouragement in our own life. It's, it's one that's taught us how to live our life, one that's concerned with our well-being. A couple years ago, uh, my son, my oldest son's name's Gideon. He was, uh, he was in his room and... Uh, Every time he needs something, you know who he calls for? Not me. It's always mama. Every little boy wants mama, mama this, mama that, mama, 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 mama. And I was, I was really beating myself up because I thought I was a terrible dad. I really did. I was, I'm asking my wife, you know, what, what can I do better? Why, why does he never, why does he always run from me? Why when he's with me, he's always talking about you? Why is it that y'all have these great conversations? And he just looks at me like I'm a bump on the log. I'm just, I'm so confused. Why, why does he always want mama? I mean, I know you're beautiful and all, and I love you too, but I just want them to want me sometimes, you know? So one night, Gideon's in his room. Our rooms are separated by a little short hallway, and I hear my son scream, this piercing scream. He'd had a nightmare. And from the darkness of his room, I heard him scream, and then I heard, Daddy! Daddy! There are things that he goes to his mama for. But he knew that daddy was going to keep him safe. He knew that daddy was going to protect him. He knew daddy was going to be there for him to, 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 to woe his heart when, when he felt scared and the whole world around him was collapsing. He knew that he could call out to daddy. When we address God like that, there's a, a tenderness and a loving. There's compassion. There's concern that comes with those terms. And it's a term and it's uh, adjectives that God himself even embraces. In, in Psalm 3, it says this, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love. When we go to God as Father, the person of our prayer, there's an intimacy that comes with that. 
Not only is there an intimacy, there's also an accessibility. We have direct access to the Father through Jesus. Praise the God. We don't have to go through a pastor, a priest, any holy person. We don't have to go through anything to have access to our Father. We can go directly to Him in prayer. And it's demonstrated beautifully in Matthew chapter 27. At the crucifixion, there's a story of how the temple veil was torn from top to bottom. In the temple, there was a a holy place. There was the holy of holies. And there was a veil that separated that holy place, that place where God resided, the place where only the high priest could go once a year to atone for the sins of the world. And at the moment of Jesus' death, that veil tore from top to bottom. And for now and forevermore, we have direct access to the Father. If you have your Bibles open in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 18 and 19, it says this, For through Him we both have access to In one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. The person of prayer, God that Father, there's intimacy and there's accessibility. The second thing that we see in these these prayers from Paul is the posture of prayer, the posture of prayer. So in the prayer in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, it says this. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. The posture of prayer. The first thing we see about our posture in prayer is this attitude of dependence. We see in this verse where he says, he bowed his knee. Let me just tell you, Jewish men didn't bow for anything. When they prayed, they stood, they raised their hands. But this attitude of bowing is not only a physical dependence, but it's a spiritual dependence. Look just at uh, Luke chapter 18. If you'll just listen along as I read, there's a story, a parable that you're familiar with. And it says this in Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. And he, Jesus, also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people swindlers, unjust, adulterers, and even like that tax collector. You see, God, I fast twice a week. I pay tithes for all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. The tax collector realized his need for the Father. Have you ever found yourself in that moment where you just need God? Unfortunately, maybe this is just a Western culture concept that we as Americans have, is that we don't like depending on anyone for anything. We want to do it all of ourselves. You know, it's easy for us to, to beat up individuals. I, I can't help but think of, of Mary and Martha. And we paint this picture of Martha running around the house, doing all these things while Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. And we look and we say, Mary, we should be like Mary. We should be sitting at the feet of Jesus. But how often do we attest our spiritual vitality or our, our spiritual uh, recognition based off the things that we've done? Oftentimes, if we're not careful, we're not too far off from the Pharisee in the parable that I shared. God, I'm okay. I went to church. I read my Bible. I try to pray. I give. I come help in the food pantry. I came help give out turkeys at the Thanksgiving event that we had over at the church. I do all of these things. I'm all right, right? But no, our our attitude should be those of individuals who sit at the feet of Jesus like Mary did. One English preacher, his name was Charles Simeon, he said this about pastors. He said, it's easier for a preacher to study five hours for a sermon than to pray for his people one half hour. Think about that. I'm doing all the right things as a pastor. I'm doing it. I'm I'm studying. I'm preparing. I'm getting ready. But it's easier for me to do that for five hours than to pray for one half hour. We're having vacation Bible school at, at my church next week. And I will see, I mean, it's a hall hands on deck affair over there at Metairie Baptist. We have everyone's there. I mean, there's, if you are not volunteering at Vacation Bible School, you are the odd man out. I mean, everyone is involved. 
And it'll be, it'll be late nights, it'll be early mornings, it'll be go, go, go for three full days. And at the end of it, we'll all be exhausted. You know the scary part of it? It's easier for us to do that than to pause and to pray. How about this? I've been going 15, 20 minutes now. I don't even know. I guess I do need to check the time. But, uh, you know, we can all sit here for 30 minutes and hear me talk about prayer. And we can to leave here today, go home this afternoon, and for 30 minutes to block out every distraction in this world and to pray. We need to be dependent. We need to be dependent on who God is. It's, it's a spiritual dependency, but it's also a physical dependency that we have. In the Lord's Prayer, it says this, Give us this day our daily bread. We realize that when we go to God in prayer, when our posture of prayer is dependence, we need you, Lord, for every spiritual thing of our heart, but we need you for every physical thing that we need as well. Lord, I need you. Not only is it a posture of prayer dependence, it's also a posture of selflessness. Of selflessness. Think about this for a second. When Paul is writing this letter to the church in Ephesus, he is sitting in prison. And you never hear him mention it. In the midst of his prayers, he's not saying, Lord, get me out of this mess. Hey, church, pray that the Lord will free me of everything that's going on in my life. But here's how he is praying. If you'll look, I'll just kind of bounce around the verses for a second. In, in, uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, in, verse, uh, in chapter 3, it says this. Just several verses here. That he would grant your, verse 16, in your inner man, verse 16, in your hearts, verse 17, that you being rooted, verse 17, that you may be filled, verse 19. All of Paul's prayers wasn't for himself. It was for the church. Does that mean that we don't pray for ourselves? No, that's not what that means. There are moments where we can pray for ourselves. But Paul realized that the things that he was praying over the lives of the church, that someone out there was also praying those things over his life. See, for Paul, the first thing was always the kingdom. It was always bigger than him. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Here was the order. First it was the kingdom. Second was my troubles. The focus was always out there. My troubles will resolve themselves. If we're always focused on the kingdom, the Lord will protect and care for us. There's a posture of prayer of dependence. There's a posture of prayer of selflessness. There's also a focus. There's also a focus. In Ephesians chapter 7, uh, verse 18, it says this, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling What are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints? We'll read that in a second. But the focus here is that I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. The posture of our prayer should be focused on knowing God more. A couple years ago, uh, probably in the middle of the pandemic, uh, some friends and my wife introduced us uh, to a game. It was a card game called Skin Deep. Um, I hated this game. Uh, I'll explain why in a second. Uh, But the concept of the game is this. It's not like a traditional card game. You sit face-to-face with someone you care about, and there's different kind of decks. There's there's cards for uh, card decks for for couples, for friends, for a whole host of things. But you sit face-to-face with the individual that you're playing the game with, and you pull a card and you ask a question. And the questions are, are things like this. Name the top five things you love about me. When was the last time I surprised you and why? When you close your eyes and think of me, what do you see? Why do you love me? Here's why I hate this game. I love it, and I hate it. It's it's, it's really kind of confusing. I love it because it's amazing to see how well people know you. I hate it because it's amazing to see how well people know you. It's almost scary, and I don't like being known like that. I don't like feeling like people know me better than I know myself. I don't like feeling like you're dissecting everything. And I mean, this game can get brutal. I've seen people leave laughing. I've seen people leave crying. I've seen people leave throwing things. Like It's like you've got to be secure in your relationship with the individual you're playing with if you're going to play. Because people know you. When's the last time we've sought to know our Heavenly Father like that? We've been uh, studying with a group of men that I'm involved with, um, the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, we just started a few weeks ago, and we've 
we're in the Beatitudes, and we're memorizing the, the Sermon on the Mount, and we're talking about one Beatitude a week right now. And I get to the first Beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. I'm playing that back in my head. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? So then I start looking to Jesus and the the way he lived his life and the attitude that he demonstrated. And how can I how can I know him like that? I've walked around for the last three weeks with this heaviness of, of how can I how can I know my Savior? When was the last time we focused on God like that? There was an old song that said this. You may have heard it. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. When I come to prayer, I want to focus on God like that. I want to lay aside everything that I want. Even when I feel like the temporary things taking place in my life are urgent. I just want to be dependent. I want to depend on Christ. I want to be selfless. I want to be focused on Him like that. Our posture of prayer. The final thing that we see in this passage is the priorities of prayer. The priorities of prayer. In verse uh, 18 and 19, it says this. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, Paul says, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. The priorities of prayer. The first thing that we should be praying for is praying for hope. Now, the hope that we see here, the hope of his calling, as Ephesians calls it, is the assurance of eternal life promised by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We oftentimes think of hope as something that's this fleeting idea, that it's a a wish, that I just hope this will happen. I'll just hope that this may take place. But hope is not that. Hope is the confident expectation of what God has promised And its strength, the strength of hope, is found in God's faithfulness. And time and time again, the promise that we can always go back to is the gospel. Daily, we need need hope in our own lives. And biblical hope helps us remain calm when the whole world around us is crumbling. And I think there's two areas, there's two categories of hope that we're always straining towards, that we always are wanting, that is all found in the gospel. The first is that we need hope in our eternity. You've heard in Romans chapter 5, he mentions it just uh, beautifully, Paul does. But God demonstrated his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We know in John 3, 16 that all who believe can have faith in Jesus Christ. That's where we're at. Our hope for our eternity, our hope for our eternity, the hope that we need is all found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we also need hope in our present. Sometimes it gets so hard for us to look forward to the hope that's out there of eternity when we're having issues take place in our own life. Listen how the psalmist described it in Psalm 121. I lift my eyes towards the mountain. Where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and our strength, a helper who's always found in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid. So how does the, the hope of the gospel that saves us help us in this moment? Here's how. When we're facing a huge issue in our job, a layoff, conflict with our coworkers, the hope we need is in the gospel. That one day God's going to make all things right. He's going to make all things new. When you need hope to know how to deal with relationships you have, maybe with your kids or in your marriage, the hope that we need is found in the gospel. That one day God is going to make all things new. When we're worried about something that one of our kids is into, something that our kids are doing that, we're not, that we don't approve of, our hope is in the gospel. When we're facing serious health troubles, you know where our hope is? Our hope is in the gospel. That one day God's going to make all of these things right. So when we pray, we pray for hope. The second thing we do is we pray for riches. Verse 18, the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints. Can I say something that's probably uh, uh, may be very unpopular, but it's not what, not what you think. We, as followers of Christ, are going to be very very rich one day. It's not what you think. In 1 Peter chapter 1, it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has called us to be born again to a living hope. We just talked about that. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Verse 4 of 1 Peter 1 says this, To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven 
for you. The riches and inheritance we are looking of, it's, it's the sum and substance of all that he's revealed of himself that our limited minds can only glimpse and our perfected minds will one day grasp. I can't help but think of Moses in Exodus chapter 33. Moses is meeting with God and he's pleading with God. God, let me see your face. God says, man can't see my face because they'll die. Moses says, but, 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 but come on, God, but please. And God says, how about this, Moses? How about you shimmy down beside that rock over there, and I'll cover your face, and I'll walk by you, and I'll remove my hand, and you can see my back. That's exactly what God did. And the story goes that as he went down from the mountain, from meeting with God, that Moses' face shone. I've always longed for the day that I can see my Savior face to face. Think about that for a second. As followers of Christ here on this earth, we, we wonder, we, we walk, we go through this life with this faith that we hold so dear and that we know is true. There's just this little bit of us that just wants to grasp hold and hold on physically to see with our eyes that, that our faith will be made sight and that we can see our Savior. I don't know how many of you in here are married or in a relationship, uh, but, but you can probably recall to those, uh, those few months when you first started dating your, your spouse, your significant other. Uh, I remember I met my wife at, at seminary, and um, we were living in single dorms, and we used to go for these long walks uh, around campus. Uh, we, were, we were broke, so we would wait till, uh, till 9 o'clock when you go to Applebee's on Veterans and get half-price appetizers. I mean, we lived for those $3.50 slider trays that they had at Applebee's. I mean, we were, we were living the high life. We would have long walks through the French Quarter, people watching and eating beignets because that was right within our budget. Everywhere I went, I would talk about her. I was telling my friends about her. I was telling my family about her. I just longed to be with her more. I just wanted to be with Lee all the time. Do you long for eternity like that? Do you long for the riches of the inheritance that we have of eternity? That moment where we can see our Savior face to face. Pray for riches. It's the only place where we will find satisfaction. The third thing we do is we pray for power. We pray for power. In Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 20, it says this, Which he brought about in Christ, that power... In verse 19, it's talking about the power which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. When we look and we see of the greatness of the power towards us who believe, we can see it in the resurrection of Jesus. The power was demonstrated in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, in his exaltation when he sat at the right hand of God, in his dominion over all of this. And the Bible makes clear that the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, a verse that we know very common, we talk about missions or evangelism, says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and of the earth. When we pray for power, here's what we're praying for. We're praying for power to be a witness. We're praying for power in the midst of crazy life circumstances, and we pray for power over our fears. There's one other thing that we pray for, and then I'll wrap this up, all right? The last thing we pray for is we pray for love. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 and 19, through 19, it says this. I pray that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. One commentator describes how you can find a love like this. The first place you can find a love like this, a biblical love like this, is in a church. When you look around this room today, there's only one thing that unites us, and that's Jesus Christ. I go to church with some weird people. I can say that. It's just us here and all the people on YouTube, all right? Um, there's people there that, uh, that like LSU football. I do not. There are people there who are singled and married. There are people there who have kids, who don't have kids. There are people there who uh, have, uh, that, 
hate sports. I love sports. There's people there that drink Starbucks coffee. I don't understand why. I drink good coffee. I mean, the, the, the gamut is just across the board. But you know what unites us? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ, the love that you find in that. That's right. When you see a body of believers gathered, you can see a biblical love. The second thing is that it takes your mind. Love is not only emotion, but when we read Scripture, we can know that God loves us. We can look at the crucifixion, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and know in our minds that that is love. And the third place is that we, take, we realize that God's love is comprehensive. God's love is so great that it can handle this vertical relationship. He can provide eternity for us, but he's also a horizontal love where he is demonstrating his power over all of our problems, and that is love. So we look today. We have the person of prayer, our Heavenly Father. We see a posture of prayer when we look and realize that we are individuals who have dependence and selflessness and focus We know the priorities of prayer, and we pray for hope, and we pray for riches, and we pray for love, and we pray for power. And there's a fourth point on there, and it's not in the the text, but it really, I guess, it's more of an invitation for you. What is your practice of prayer? Would people know that you love a heavenly Father based off your prayer life today? And My bold invitation to you today is why not now? Why not today we decide that we would want to know Jesus like that? That we want to commune with him. That we want to take every big problem, every little problem, every thoughts of our mind, every desires of our heart, and we would just want to take it to the Lord in prayer. Grace, today, that's my challenge for you. Will you join me as we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. Lord, today I know I need to, and I'm sure there's others in this room, that we just need to repent and tell you we are sorry for not coming to you in prayer more often. Lord, we allow the busyness of life, the distractions of life, to get in the way of a relationship that we long and desire to have with you. Lord, all too often we find ourselves busy about doing things, even good things, for the church, for other people, and chalk that up as having a good relationship with you. And Lord, you don't want our good actions, but you want our hearts. Lord, today I pray that as we come to you, as we see that Paul did, we come to you as a heavenly father, as a daddy, that longs to hear from his children. Pray that when we come to you, Lord, we do so depending on you, not seeking to get our own things uh, out of prayer, not, not seeking to be selfish, but to be focused on you. Lord, I pray that when we come to you that we're praying for hope, we're praying for love, we're praying for riches, we're praying for power so that we can have an impact on those around us. And Lord, this week, for everyone here involved, God, I pray that you will make prayer a practice of our life. Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.